Good morning. So glad you're here with us this morning. Well, I welcome you to worship at Harrisburg United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us, whether you're here in person or with us online. We warmly welcome you and, and glad that you are a part of our service this morning. If you're visiting with us online, let us know by liking uh, the, uh, the feed or making a comment, and uh, we will definitely respond to uh, things we find online. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we warmly welcome you if you're here. Uh, in the pew in front of you is a little green card for a little more information. Or if you have a need, like a prayer request or something, uh, you can also use that same card to let us know about your prayer requests, and, and uh, we will give those to our, our prayer team. So we're so excited that you're here with us this morning. My name is Richard Smith. I am the pastor of families and students here at, the, at uh, Harrisburg, and excited to be here this morning. This morning I do have two announcements. Uh, first one is homecoming is coming up. It is uh, uh, September the 24th, and we're playing a big day that day of music and celebration. And uh, afterwards we will be having lunch and it's all covered dish. So we are relying on everyone to bring something. Um, so right now on the sign up list, I think there's banana pudding. So I hope that person brings a lot <laughs> of banana pudding. Uh, but we were asking that folks would sign up online. It's, the link is in your email and the, uh, the, the, uh, the weekly announcement page that we send out. Also, you can always call the church office and Miss Kara would be glad to sign you up for whatever it is you'd like to bring. And that's so that we can have a variety of things uh, here for our, our celebration. So it'll be a fun, fun day that afternoon. My other, one other announcement is that um, in starting in October, we are starting a stewardship campaign. Normally, we would do one every year, but because of COVID and because of the, uh, the campaign for the building and all that kind of stuff, we haven't done one in quite a while, but it's gonna be a focus on, an emphasis on a study called Enough, and that God gives us actually more than enough. And so what is our response to that when it comes to giving back to God? And so uh, there's a book study, there's gonna be offerings of several classes for that as well as an opportunity for us to really think about our giving and what it means for our faith as we give to God in our regular offering. So I hope you'll be excited about those things. And one other personal thing, how many of you for the past several weeks I've talked about turning off the cell phones, especially during worship? And it's not because interrupting the pastor's sermon, that still happens sometimes, but <laughs> it's more about you consciously giving focus to God and to hearing what God has to say to you because our devices are so distracting constantly. So the challenge still is turn them off during worship and not because I'm worried about uh, somebody calling you in the middle of service and disrupting service, but more about your willingness to connect to what God is trying to tell you. <laughs> That's not his regular ringtone, I tell you that. Uh, so, uh, when your own phone rings, you're in trouble, dude. So, you're on your own for that. Uh, but then also, I want to challenge you not just to do it Sunday mornings. A couple of you have been doing it every week. But try it at home. Like, give yourself 15, 20 minutes in the morning or right before bed. Just turn it all the way off and ask God to speak to your heart and give yourself a chance to listen. <laughs> now he's not being funny anymore. So as we, uh, as we gather for this morning, I invite you to, to breathe in, take a deep, deep breath, and slowly let it out. And I invite you to welcome the presence of God into your minds and in your hearts as we begin worship. Would you please stand with me for our first song this morning? I mean, for our call to worship. It's on the wrong page. We come together as one, united in our common loyalty to Jesus Christ. We come to worship and praise the God who calls us here. Let us open our hearts to the one another, just as Christ has opened his heart to us, and God will be glorified. Will you remain standing for our first hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross?
I invite you to be seated. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the breath of life and for the possibilities of what may come when we have the opportunity to serve you and to connect with you, God. But may you also remember that that connection leads us into a deeper sense of responsibility for those around us, whether they're our members sitting beside us or our neighbors next door. You call us to a life of service and of love of everyone, God. So continue to do that. And may we be receptive to what you have to say to us as we worship you this morning. Lord, we think about all the things that are going on. Lord, we want to celebrate you, God. In the midst of the struggles and the trials, Lord, as we remember the hard times, as well as the good, Lord, we ask that you continue to help us to realize that no matter what or where we are, there's always hope. As we see even sometimes in the world around us, hopelessness, God, you are still the deliverer of hope. And may we celebrate that. And Lord, as we think about some of the things going on around the world, Lord, we lift up the people of Morocco as they recover from a huge earthquake and so many folks lost over there. And Lord, as we continue to worship, we think about um, tomorrow, Lord, it's 9-11. And the further away that day gets from us, the less we seem to remember. But God, this morning we pray that we would remember, not just those things, but that we remember your hand in the world around us. Lord, in 9-11 there was such tragedy and such loss of life. But then we also forget those heroes who went above and beyond to land planes safely and to rescue people who were injured and hurt. Lord, may we remember so that we can be changed, so that we can engage the world with different hands and different eyes, with eyes that love and support. And may we not live in the fear that we tend to want to after events like that. So God, use us and transform us into something different. Help us to see that the tragedy can be overcome with your grace and with the hope that you bring. And this morning, as Pastor Frederick comes and brings our sermon on unity, I pray that we would be a unified people in this place and also in our communities, that we would not seek ways of separation from each other, but that we would be unified. And one way that we show our unity is by praying that prayer that you taught us so long ago, Lord. And may we say it with our hearts this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I invite our ushers to come forward for our time of offering. sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that the word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The word of God for all people. As we sing our next hymn, all children ages three through first grade are invited to go to children's church. The waiting at the back door there. Oh, oh, oh. 
grace and peace to each and every one of you from God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord I do apologize for my phone going off over there it was an operator error but we are so grateful to come to join together in worship as we continue our leadership series and I solicit those who listen by social media and those who are here as we have conversation around this uh, leadership series. Uh, we talked about the seven. We talked about the seven stones of leadership for mm -hmm. God's purpose, and we've already talked about the stone of devotion, love of God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. You know it. You got it. And then also the stone of consecration. God has to consecrate us before we do his work. The anointing is not on you. The anointing is on the gift that God gives us. And sometimes he has to depend, he has to work with us privately before he allow us publicly. There's many times spending time with him that you wonder and ask him, say, Lord, why me? Why not you? But he consecrates you and whom he calls, he equips to do what they're called to do. Another was the stone of preparation. God will not send you out and ready if you're not prepared. And uh, preparation sometimes takes a long time. But God is in the midst of it. His time is not our time. He's on Kairos time. We don't understand why he does what he does, but he has our best at heart. And the most challenging one that I've, that I've prepared this series is the one today. The stone of unity which is sounds simple, but yet still, and here we're gonna hear from a man who once blasphemed the church by the name of the Apostle Paul, as he penned these words to the church in Rome. And those who are able to stand, will you please stand as we uh, listen to these new scriptures that Paul gives us this morning. Paul is saying, may the God of steadfast and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And I'd like to use as a, a title of this message, One Voice. One Voice. That's correct. <laughs> ben had already told me. Is that Bennett? Yes, okay. Let us pray. <laughs> Father, in all your mercy and your grace, your servants stand behind this sacred desk. Only allow you, O oh God, to do what you call us to do. Enable me, O oh Lord, to preach this word that it'll go forth and not return void, but will accomplish what it's set out to do. Prepare our hearts and minds to hear from you. And that one voice that we can listen to to know the way and the will for all of us. Now, Lord, the word is yours, the spirit is yours, and we are yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray that the people of God say, amen. amen. As we look around, even in the past and now even in this current stage, we notice some things that are very distasteful. Our societies and their systems tend to encourage people to divide along several lines, whether it's racial, ethnic, culture lines, or else abandon what they believe in to come to the greater good that they feel we all should belong. We are country divided, but it's not so for the church. And the great apostle that penned these words that we have today was a zealot. He would love his Jewish background. Until he had that experience of a baptism on that Damascus road when Jesus called him to do what he called to do. Our world is turned upside down. Sometimes it's hard even to grab a little hope. But Paul addressed this text in a different manner. He did not ask the Jews to give up their Jewish heritage. He did not ask the Gentiles to become Jews. 
As a matter of fact, Paul instead affirmed the richness of the ethnic backgrounds of both groups. He understood that it's challenging. If you look at verse 7, he reminds us, but it still does not stop us from the unity that he's preaching in these words. When I look at this text, we look at the church as called to connect with the community. But yet Paul is not just addressing the actual community, he's addressing those who are in the church. I'm sure we don't have no division here in this church, but we, those other churches. But this is who he's addressing. And any time we make an effort to bring some inclusivity, we're going to always be hard work. It's hard work to bring people together with different mindsets and different backgrounds and diversity. But not supposed to be for the church. So Paul is addressing them. Yes, we're supposed to connect with the communities. But what about inside the church? And in the fourth verse of this scripture, Paul talks about how the former days were written. We have the guarantee because God has given us steadfastness. He's given us encouragement that what come may, the church will always be the church. Did he not say, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not come up against it. But it's not the church. It's the people who make up the church. So Paul is giving hope in the theme of this text. Through this letter, he's letting us know that sometimes hope could be elusive sometimes. Hope could be challenging in this modern world because we're up against so much this day and time. But the church, as he's reminding us, those who come together, he say where one or two or three are touching and agreeing, then God is in the midst of it. The church is exempt from this. But are they really? Because Paul is really addressing them here. And we can look at it in two ways. We can do all our planning, all our preparing, and then all of a sudden, when it don't go well, we put it on God. God, where are you in the midst of all? Did you include him in your planning, in your praying, in the direction you want us to live? Well, I'm going to give you the second one. Maybe somebody who will say, oh, if I just hit the lottery, oh, I'm going there. <laughs> everything will be all right. And things I have a chance, be luck or faith that everything will turn out well. But Paul is neither talking about either one of those here. He's talking about something more intentional into us. So I pondered the question as I was preparing. When has your freedom been a stumbling block to someone else? Sometimes we take freedom for granted. And somewhere, and not in no other countries, but in this world, somebody is struggling. But we take so much for granted. Mass little heart of needs of food, clothing, and shelter. We have that. We are right. But somebody is without those main things for living. And how often do we take our freedom for granted? Richard prayed about 9-11. And every one of us in here know exactly where we were when 9-11 penetrated our country. I was in seminary at that time. And the president of the seminary called us all together. He stopped all classes. Because we thought it was all this news going on. He brought us into the auditorium. And he said, I want you to just feel where you all are now. Whatever comments you want to make, how you feel. And some were bitter. Some was mad. Some didn't understand what to say. And then he, after he asked those questions and listened to us, he said, now, preachers, what are you going to preach Sunday morning from that pulpit? These are the type of things we sometimes take for granted. But here we are. And as time passed, sometimes our sensitivity to those methods don't even come across our conscience because we are OK. But the church must be the church, as Paul demonstrates here in verse 5. 
Paul calls your Lord the God of endurance. This title really hit at the center of this text. God give us the endurance to do what he has called us to do. Your hope is not to be found in your own willingness. Yes, I know sometimes we think we are, but, but the ability to endure your hope and endurance come from the grace that God has given all of us. We can't go but so far. But it's that unshakable, listen to me, that enduring grace that he allow us to have because he's already did what he needed to do for us to be here. So it's not about our willingness. That's part of it. But it's the work of grace that allow us to do what we are called to do. Your hope is, is that you have been welcomed into a community, a gathering here of the church, where we can endure what come may. We have the Lord on our side. And someone need to also know that God is real. Now you're looking at me, why is this so important? Your endurance, your willingness have a limitation. Because you can be the best of a Christian. And sometimes you get tired and weary. Well, I don't feel like praying today. But God gives us that endurance. And sometimes you have to just crawl out your bed and go to your knees. I remember when my daughter was a little girl and listened to her pray. And she prayed for the dog, the cat, the neighbors, all that, just to stay up longer. <laughs> but after a while, you want to hear your children say some of those prayers that really bring some experience into play. And we all grow, but sometimes our endurance is spotty. I don't feel like going to that church meeting. I'm not even going to turn around. <laughs> My time won't allow me to do this for the church. It gets spotty. We're real. It happens. But God gives us the endurance. There'll be moments when we forget. We have what you call grace amnesia. When we receive all God's grace, but we don't want to give grace. Even to those who we have different opinions about. Yeah, that's a good one. Grace amnesia. And what happens is the same grace that God extended to you, we are to extend to one another. Not just outside the church, inside the church. There will be moments, big and small, where you will rebel against each other. I just don't like the color of the carpet. Many churches have been <laughs> arguing about the carpet. And somebody says, well, I'm leaving the church because they didn't do this or they didn't do that. We're going to rebel at times. But this is nothing new. Because I read somewhere over there in Ezra, Chapter 3, verse 12, where it talked about when the new temple was being built. And some of the old ones, the Levites, and some of the priests were upset because they didn't want, they was crying because a new temple was being built. So you imagine how many church wars could happen with just the color of the carpet. Or my pew. Or oh, I'm down, I'm, 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 it's tight, but it's right. No, we just stand great. So what is Paul trying to tell us here today? Unity go beyond getting our way. But when you're a Christian, sometimes we can say, I'm not going to say the nasty things to people. Sometimes we can turn people off. It's not because we're ignorant. It's really because we got to a point that we don't care. Oh, trust me, I've been in church almost over a third of my life. And some get to the point where they just don't care and say anything. But Paul is saying, not for the church here. Why is that? Right there in verse 5, he said, what is the point of such harmony? It is not for the peace, of sake of peace, but so that we gather together that God may hear one voice. One voice. God is not the author of confusion. If we come here with different types of worship and not centered on God himself, 
Do you think he hears heaven? One voice in harmony, showing our blessings for his grace. One voice and one voice alone that we're on the Lord's side. Then he look at verse 6, he tells us, our world has forgotten that human creatures exist, not for the fulfillment of ourselves, but for the glory of God. Everything we do should be for the glory of God. Everything that we initiate should be to the glory of God. And the text here reminds us there are weak and strong among us. The strong was encouraged the weak. Because we all are trying to get there on one accord to encourage believers to welcome one another. This church has been blessed. Some new faces and new people who've come to be a part of this ministry. Embrace that. Encourage that. Just as Christ welcomed you and me. That's what Paul is preaching here today. Unity within the church. But he don't leave it there. You would know how many points I have by the number of verses I elaborate on. If you've been hearing me long enough, this is the last one. In verse 7, he reminds us, accept one another, then just as Christ has accepted you, why? In order to bring praise to him. That's what this is all about. When we get to know each other, we can have differences, but at the same time, we bring glory to God when we encourage one another. Who did Christ not welcome? He said, bid not the, not the little children to come unto me. He also accepted those who were outcasts. He accepted those who were foreigners. And then he said, we are like sheep that's gone astray. And that's why he calls himself the great shepherd. So he could tend the sheep. Give you this one, this won't cost you nothing. Cattle are driven, sheep are led. Somebody get that when they get home this afternoon. So God is constantly tenderizing, taking care of us in all circumstances and situations. He is the good shepherd. He don't deny anyone. Now, I ask you a question this morning. What individuals or types of people do you have difficulty accepting? That's a personal question. Why not commit that today to God who's waiting to hear you? Say, Lord, I need help in this. God gives us strength for service, not status. I need to say that again. God gives us strength for what he called us to do of service and not for status. That goes out the window when it comes to him. Endurance and encouragement are his ultimate gifts he gives to the body of Christ. That's why Paul said, be encouraged. Endure the race. Ultimately, God's gift will enable us. And when we meditate on scripture, individually, and come together collectively on one accord, God hears one voice, and he responds. That's the kind of God we serve. Therefore, Paul prays for the spirit of unity. Before you leave it today, I hope you pray that we pray for the spirit of unity despite who we come in contact with, despite who, what ethnicity or background he may have. That's what he's looking at. Unity. What a mighty word. Minimize the individual desires. Because we can put our differences aside. But God is the one who give us the endurance God is the one that gives us the encouragement that everything's going to be all right.
Now, this doesn't mean that we won't be always going to see, believe, as a believer, see eye to eye on things. That's not going to happen. God made us individually. He know the number of hairs on our head. He know what we're going to do before we even do it. So we may not see eye to eye on some things. But the most Christ-filled spirit vision is to see the unity that God brings in his church. His church, the ecclesia. His church, that he may hear one voice. God is always waiting there. Unity. The biggest challenge. Because we have to deal with in here. But we got a world out there that's constantly trying to come up against it. And I do believe the church is blessed. It's the ones who have one voice and praising God that they all on one accord. What come may, despite who they may, who they may be or where they came from. I do believe that heaven is going to look differently than what we think it is. I do believe heaven is going to be a place where we'll get there and the joy of none of this division will be around. I do believe heaven is the place I hope that we all make our home. But just as the Apostle Paul, I've been crucified in Christ. Now I, but the Christ in me. Paul, of any of these, who wrote a third of the New Testament, could say these words then that's hope, that's endurance, that's encouragement. Be encouraged. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the people of God say, amen. amen. The stone of unity, as we stand with our closing hymn, maybe some man, woman, boy, or girl this morning, will you please stand? Kind of by baptism in your Christian experience, or if you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, we don't claim to be a perfect church, but we're trying. And I pray to God that you have the discernment to pray to God as to where God will have you be. Thank you all for your attention, but more than anything, stay encouraged. And also know that God will give us the endurance.
gracious God, we thank you for this mountain of privilege. And what a privilege to know that when we fall short of the mark as imperfect people, you give us the encouragement and endurance. We pray, O oh Father, that we be mindful that the church is not the building for your people. And we pray, O oh God, that we always be honoring your name. It's not about status. It's not about reputation. But to know that you are our Savior, who extended and give us grace daily to do your good and perfect will. Now may the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in each and every one of us as we part from this place, but never from your presence. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the people of God say, Amen. Amen.